Dr. Joseph, thank you for joining us again. Uh, we really appreciate it. And as, as usual, I give kind of give you carte blanche to um, give us the latest update and information as you see fit. So welcome aboard and what do you have for us? And are we gonna share the screen again? Yes, sir. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, it's always a pleasure to be here. Let's, uh, uh, this is what we put on tap for today for, for the next 15, 20 minutes. And I've put down epidemiology versus individualized medicine. And th that was added to my slide deck uh, about uh, 45 minutes ago uh, with the uh, release of the information at uh, 1 a.m. Eastern time last night that uh, the president and the first lady have been, uh, have been reported to be testing positive. So I want to address that. And then we'll talk about some things that I think have been in the news uh, recently, at least the past week or two, a lot of talk about herd immunity, vaccine, and then some new testing. So this, this is what I added this morning. And this is a concept that I would like all of us to remain aware. The definition of, of epidemiology is a branch of medical science that looks at all of the factors that determine the presence or absence of disease or, or disorders. So it's an overview. It's based on statistics. And the things that we look at in the epidemiology of COVID are reported excellently by Supervisor Anderson. We talk about the number of tests, the risk factors for disease, the complications that are broken down by age, by underlying uh, risk factors, by illnesses, by pulmonary disease, the complications as they occur in the younger children versus adults, and the ratios of those. And more statistics uh, discuss hospitalization and what is the likelihood of surviving hospitalization and not and of course, the, the death rate associated with COVID by groups. So this, this is something that we have discussed many times here, but, but I wanna focus on the, this. Medical epidemiology is not individualized medicine. And I wanna caution all of us that whatever we know about COVID statistics, does not apply to any single person, including the President of the United States. I'm sure we will hear over the, the next several days about percentages of complications and percentages of, of hospitalization as they apply to a single person. Don't do that. You would never want to be, want to be treated by your doctor based on a statistic. Medical epidemiology is critically important, but it's important for developing public health policy. It tells us what we want to do as a community, as a county, as a state, as a country, but not how we want to manage an, a single person. It's not fair to apply those statistics to the likelihood of, of a single person falling into any group. So what we will hear uh, about Mr. Trump really does not, not fit into the medical epidemiology, but rather the important parts are what is said by his doctor, his healthcare team. So just let me caution you that I, I am expecting and already have heard on this morning's news, a lot of things that are inappropriate applying statistics to a single person. And that'll be my comments so far, or at least as of today, uh, regarding the new news that was last night. Now, what I had attempted to talk about was two big factors of how we control infectious diseases uh, in, in the modern era. Now, this is medical control. So there's two big arms. There's treatment and there's prevention. And the treatment is basically for bacterial diseases. We have a lot of antibiotics and so penicillin for strep throat and multiple drugs for pneumonia. And when a person develops a urinary tract infection, we have a plethora of antibiotics that can be described. So treatment is after a person gets an infection, typically applies to bacterial disease. We have very, very few ways to prevent bacterial disease with immunizations. 
There are many ways to, to prevent bacterial disease with, with what I will call engineering controls. That is non-medical aspects. But I'm focusing today on just the medical side of how we control infectious diseases. So treatment generally applies to bacterial disease. Prevention, on the other hand, applies to viral diseases. And that's because we have very, very few drugs that can effectively cure a viral infection. So the way we control viral diseases is with immunization. Whether the immunization is from a vaccine, whether it's naturally occurring, that's how we, we prevent uh, infectious diseases. Now there's many, many ways to prevent infectious diseases that, that fall into the engineering control aspect. And they're critically important worldwide. Uh, mosquito nets, mosquito repellents, uh, uh, wearing masks, uh, avoiding people, quarantine, isolation, those are all important to prevent an infectious disease. But when we're talking today about the medical control, and I want to talk about immunity, and that is sort of my segue into what has been on the news a lot, and that is herd immunity. Herd immunity means, and it actually came from the turn of the century, from a herd of cattle who were getting brucellosis. And, and it was discussed of how many cattle need to be immune to brucellosis so that the disease doesn't spread. So an epidemic is an uncontrolled spread of a disease. It's more than what is expected. When there is herd immunity, it doesn't imply that there will be no infections, but it means that there will be no epidemic. All we will see will be the expected amount of infection. Now, now with some newer diseases, there was, a, there was a, a, an attempt to change this uh, to community immunity as we apply this to humans. It just didn't stick. So we're now still talking about herd immunity in humans as if all of us are the same as cattle. And as long as we keep the concept correct, we understand it. Looking at, the, at that cartoon on the right, if we, there's, there's about 250 uh, uh, persons in that cartoon. If, if, if we look at those who are gold and say that those individuals are immune, that is, they are not susceptible to disease, those who are green are not immune, and those who are red have the infection. This is the goal of herd immunity. The goal is that, yes, we will have people who are infected, they're the ones who are red, but they won't create an epidemic. Only those few persons who are green are susceptible to infection. So you can see sort of down in the middle of the bottom, those people are close enough that the spread might be by a respiratory disease. So this is our target. Our target is that we want enough people in our community to be immune, not that we want to eliminate or not that we can eliminate infection, but that we can eliminate an epidemic so that we will have only the expected number of new cases. And now the table on the left gives you an idea of where we are. This shows the herd immunity for vaccine preventable infectious diseases. Uh, diphtheria, measles, mumps, rubella, and all of those that are listed. And on the far right of that table, it tells you the threshold for herd immunity. And the most important thing is, is not the specific number, but that the number is different by disease. So for example, for diphtheria, herd immunity, we need 85% of the people to be immune. But for mumps, we need 75%. And this is based on the infectivity of the virus. So the higher the infectivity, the higher number we need for herd immunity. Now that column that is labeled R0 or R0 tells you that, let's just take the top line. If a person has diphtheria, he or she is likely to spread it to six or seven people. If a person has measles, that's much more contagious and he or she is likely to, sp to spread it to 12 to 18 people. Now let's translate that to our current pandemic. 
the likelihood of spread from one infected person to another one is lower than all of those. It's about two to three, meaning with no precautions taken, one person with COVID is likely to spread it to two or three others. And what we are seeing on the right is that the projection then is what we need is about 60% of the people in our community to be immune to create herd immunity. So much lower than most of those virals, viral diseases there. But the point is we are not even close. The point is that the best we see is maybe in small pockets of New York City, which is very population dense, there may be as high as 20% of the people immune. That's not herd immunity. If we say that our target for COVID has now been adjusted down to about 60% from what we know so far, even New York is not close. Those are some other cities around the world. And in our community here, we are at about three or 4% some counties 5% in the Bay Area. So this is just an overview that our target is pretty far away. And we're not going to get there until we get an effective vaccine. So just, to, just as a summary, herd immunity is currently our best solution to a new pandemic. We don't have therapy for this virus. There's, there is likely no natural immunity, at least so far, we have not defined any genetic uh, factor that makes an individual naturally immune. They may be out there, but as of today, the answer is no one in the world has natural immunity. We're not close anywhere in the world to having herd immunity, not even in, in those areas that have the highest number of infections, there still are uh, increasing numbers of infections because the immunity level is far below 60%. The principle of herd immunity is new infections will continue, but they can be slowed until we get herd immunity. There are interventive methods that, that we've talk about, talked about here many times. Uh, there's masking, there's social distancing, there's common sense, there's isolation, there's quarantine, all of these will slow down the new infection, but they're not going to go away. And herd immunity in our community, in our country, in the world is very unlikely to occur without a vaccine. Vaccine will be important to make all of us immune so that we can get back to a normal life. And that's just a great segue for me to talk about what's going on in the vaccine world. There certainly has been a lot of news about vaccine, uh, about, about the timing of release. Uh, a lot of, uh, of different opinions are out there. And let me see if I can just try to bring it into an understandable situation. There are three available platforms for making vaccine. There's live virus, and we use that today. We use live virus for measles, mumps, rubella. Uh, some of the flu shots that are available this year use live virus. Now, those live viruses can't cause an infection. They are weakened uh, genetically, but they do stimulate a response to protect us. Uh, you don't get measles from a measles shot. You don't get uh, mumps from a mumps shot, but those are live viruses. Recombinant proteins are the ones that are most common. So of the 11... Uh, flu shots that will be available, or 11 flu uh, uh, products for vaccine that will be available this year, most of them are recombinant proteins, e either proteins that are made synthetically or proteins that are derived from live viruses. And, and that is, has always been the workhorse of vaccines, recombinant proteins. What's new and what is the game changer is molecular vaccines. Now, this, this is why there is so much confusion about how long is it going to take us to make a vaccine? Because we have so much experience with live virus vaccines and recombinant proteins. And, you, and I'm sure that you've heard the, the confusing information where uh, one newscaster might say, well, even if we get an effect, effective vaccine, it's going to take uh, two years to produce enough to immunize those even in our country, let alone the world. 
And others have said, no, we're ramping up and we'll be ready and it won't take that long. And I'm gonna try to, to, to explain the discrepancy. The comments about a long period of time to produce vaccine are based on number one and number two. They are labor intensive, reagent heavy, and difficult to produce. The molecular vaccines are not. They are fast tracked. Molecular vaccines can produce what you can do in two years with a recombinant vaccine, you can do in two months with a molecular vaccine. Now, molecular vaccines were first explored with the original SARS epidemic, that's SARS-1, uh, where you create a molecule of DNA or RNA and you put that in the vaccine and that is injected. The DNA and RNA then go into a host cell and produce the recombinant protein. So we're using our own body to make the recombinant proteins that creates the immunity rather than trying to do it in a laboratory. And, and so far, uh, all of the vaccines that are on the phase three trial are molecular vaccines, DNA or RNA. Uh, Moderna uh, announced the first uh, molecular vaccine with a huge press release about three or four months ago. And the term was mRNA. It's just one of the molecular products that, out, that is out there. The Johnson & Johnson product is a molecular vaccine. So these are extremely encouraging as to where we are going. So an overview of what is out there is here. We have over 150 uh, vaccines in preclinical testing. That means they're in the laboratory trying to design what molecular uh, uh, product will work. And by the way, DNA and RNA are, are really easy to make in the laboratory. And, and you make them in huge quantities very quickly. Uh, so some of the ones in preclinical testing are molecular, some are recombinant proteins. Uh, to my knowledge, no one is using a weakened live coronavirus vaccine uh, right now. So this is mostly recombinant and uh, molecular. There's 28 vaccines in phase one. And, and I wanted to go through these because they get confusing and they have been blended a lot during this pandemic. Phase one, you give a vaccine to a human. This is not animal, this is human. You give them to them and you're looking for the safety of the vaccine, anything that just jumps off the page as making a vaccine different and what dosing. And, and vaccines have to be dosed. So do you give a, a quarter of a cc, a half cc, a whole cc? Uh, that's what, what the phase one trials are doing. And after a vaccine is given, you measure the antibody response. From phase one information, you develop phase two. And currently there are 14 vaccines in phase two expanded trials. It's, it's similar to phase one, except the dose is now the same. And this is given to hundreds of persons and you wanna spread this out. So it's going to be given to children, uh, to college age kids and to, to those of advanced age. And looking at the antibody response, so this is still baseline data, and there are 14 of those that are now in phase two. And there are 11, and this is the most amazing news that we have for all of us. There are 11 in phase three. This is, does the doggone vaccine work? And it's given to tens of thousands of people. Moderna started with 15,000 people and reported excellent early results. The Johnson & Johnson or, or Janssen uh, product is given to 60,000 people. And, and after phase three, if phase three is successful in the absence of serious side effects, then you apply for early approval. Now, there are five vaccines that have achieved early approval, but none in the United States. Early approval was given to three in China and two in Russia. And this means that they are open to either the general public or defined populations. We're not there in the United States yet, but it's coming. So this is the process. And, and after early approval, if it looks good, then there's FDA approval and the vaccine is available to any practitioner. 
So this is the sequence of events. We have an important part for us to understand is there are 11 in phase three efficacy trials, and that's extremely exciting. Now, to put this into the timeline, uh, this was a cartoon that, that was created by a friend of mine based on the modeling of, of vaccine development and what we have learned. So we're, this is a, a, a 24 hour clock. The goal is if we consider vaccine development as a, I mean a 12 hour clock, if we consider vaccine development as a 12 hour project, we started at the top where it says start of the pandemic. I, after we got the first news of the pandemic, after China released the genome or the genetic sequence of the virus, within two weeks, we were developing in the NIH a molecular vaccine. That gives you an idea how quickly this moved. You can't do that with recombinant proteins. If you know the genetic structure of a virus, then you can start using that those genes to make a vaccine. And it was about two weeks after the genetic structure was published. If you would look at this globally, and if our target is to get back up to 12, get to the top, we are at about seven o'clock. That is with looking at all of the trials, the successful results, and the prediction is that we are about two thirds of the way there. Now, I, I'm not gonna make a prediction as to the efficacy of the vaccine or the safety of the vaccine, but based on what we know of how vaccines have developed, we could be there sooner than ever before with any vaccine development. I don't think it's going, if you ask me for a prediction, I always try to avoid them, but, but based on this clock, we're not going to be there before the end of this calendar year, but there's going to, if the vaccines work and if they're safe, we're looking at something in Q1 of 2020. Now that's, I have to emphasize, that's all based as if this model is correct. But it's really based on science, not on politics, not on statistics. It's based on understanding vaccine development. So indeed it is encouraging news. Until we get there, we have to temporize. And the temporizing is testing and personal protection. So let's talk a little bit about what has happened in the United States with testing. We have now been eight months since the, the, since the first test was authorized by the CDC. And the specimen collection has gone from the deep nasopharynx, the one that is not very comfortable, uh, been called a brain biopsy. Uh, that was the very first test that was out. Then we went to one where it didn't go so far into the nose. It was a calibrated swab that went about halfway into the nose. Then there was tests developed using just the anterior part of the nose. Then saliva testing, and then just gargling. Now, now let me analogize this to the testing that, that we had with HIV disease in the 80s. We developed uh, the very first test in 1985. That was four years after the virus hit the United States. So it took four years for us to get the first diagnostic test for HIV disease. And you can, in, in the United States, we developed the first test for this within a month. There are alternatives to HIV disease, including saliva test and oral rinse, and they took 40 years. Uh, well, maybe 35 years. What we have done in eight months with, with modern science, with molecular diagnostics, with testing that is now available that wasn't available three decades ago, we have changed 35 years into eight months. Now, this, this is entitled temporizing with testing. So we now, just imagine this. What if there was a quick test, and we talk about pooled specimens, where you can collect specimens from 15 people and run one test. And if that test is negative, all 15 persons are negative. So imagine a school. 
imagine a, a school with 15 kids or, or, or a large number of kids coming into school and you break them up into groups of 15 and you have them gargle a, a, a little bit of salt water and spit it out into a container. And you put all 15 of those into one test specimen and they're all negative. Those 15 kids can go on to class. And imagine how that might apply to the entire country. That is, until we get vaccine, we are working feverishly to develop rapid testing so that we can screen large numbers of people. And they may be large numbers of people going into a school, into a college, in, into an essential business, uh, into a, a workforce of any kind. And you, we've talked about the, these tremendous problems at the uh, food manufacturing places where people are shoulder to shoulder and you can't prevent infection and maintain that type of a workflow. But what if all those people were tested every morning when they came to work? The timing for the turnaround of a test, originally when it came out, when we had the deep nasopharyngeal swab that was released by the CDC was seven days. And we are now down to many 15 minute tests. And it's extremely exciting. I'm, I'm tremendously optimistic about using testing as a way of temporizing until we get the vaccine. But test science, that is the science of, of making testing equipment does not mean availability. And I don't want to leave anyone with the information that tomorrow we're going to be screening all the kids. The test the, the testing availability, that is how you make a test kit, is a lot harder than making a vaccine. It's very, very difficult. It's time consuming. As I said earlier, vaccines are, e with, with molecular vaccines are easy to make. Test kits are not. So right now, although we have a couple hundred million test kits out there, they are, are being deployed for specific groups of people. That is those who are symptomatic, first responders, and you can see the list, certainly nursing home residents and staff, areas where uh, there is a great risk for, for an outbreak. It is not, they are not yet available with a few exceptions uh, to our, our, our community, but it's coming. This is an extremely fast moving science and rapid test kits will be here before you know it. I, I can't make a prediction. I can't tell you that next month we'll all be able to get a 15 minute test, but that's the target. And I think that test, the testing availability will be a game changer until we get a vaccine. Uh, I can tell you what's being worked on right now is a saliva test that, that where it will be a color change. And in even a home kit is being evaluated. We'll, where you can purchase a kit just like you can for a pregnancy test. This is all under development. It looks like the focus right now for all of us will be rapid testing until we get a vaccine. And so with that, 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 that concludes what I'm gonna say today. Be smart in what you hear and what you do. It certainly is a changing field. Every day there's something new. Mr. Mayor, thank you very much for the time and thank you everyone. Um, for Dr. Joseph, are there any drawbacks to molecular DNA uh, RNA generated vaccines? None identified yet. Uh, and I say that uh, intentionally. We have never given a molecular vaccine uh, to a large group of people. They were designed long ago for SARS uh, when SARS first hit. Uh, so the phase three trials are critically important for molecular vaccines. That's where, where one company is giving 15,000, another company is giving 60,000. And the purpose of that is to identify if there are unknown problems. I can tell you that they, they have all advanced to phase three without recognized problems. And Stay tuned. And a, a follow-up, as opposed to having one or two by, uh, vaccinations coming out and trying to mass produce that, if there are 11 different companies producing in, in phase three, could there eventually be 11 different vaccination 
combinations being given to people around the country. So A, it can happen a lot faster and you can probably track to see which are more effective. Yes. Uh, an analogy to that is the influenza vaccine that we've been talking about a little bit. I think there, this year there are seven different companies okay. making influenza vaccine. <laughs> the vaccine market is not one off. It's open to all pharmaceutical companies to develop. Then it gets into dosing. Some may be one dose only, some may be two dose. Uh, but they will all have to meet certain efficacy standards. Uh, there, there's one vaccine comment that, that is worth noting. Much of the COVID era, including attempted drug therapy like remdesivir, all of the testing is not FDA approved, but rather it's emergency use authorized. The FDA has announced that they will not fast track authorization of vaccines. It's one component of medicine when you start talking about diagnosis, but a completely different safety factor when you talk about giving vaccines. So I, I would like to reassure everyone that there is going to be intense oversight before a vaccine is available in the United States. And to be clear, that is good science and not politics, correct? Uh, I don't mix. I, I, I don't know anything about politics. Exactly. We're going to approach the vaccine from a scientific right. patient first yes. uh, uh, approach so that safety is important. Yes. Yes. Okay. Great. We have a, a number of questions about uh, can a surgical mask be worn uh, more than once and can you wash KN95 masks? And I know, Dr. Joseph, you've addressed masks before, but it might be useful for a quick reminder. Well, all masks are good until they are mechanically defective. A surgical mask can be worn until it's wet. So you can wear the same surgical mask for a whole day if it doesn't get wet. For those who may uh, exhale more moisture than others, it may only last a couple of hours. For Smaller people with a shorter amount of tidal volume, that's how much air they breathe in, uh, they may be able to wear it longer. They are, they are a designed polymer of paper and cannot be washed. KN95s uh, is a type of a filter, not a type of a mask. So it depends on the product that is being made. The KN95s that are used in the hospital can be reprocessed, but not with regular soap and water. They require a, a product of hydrogen uh, peroxide that, is, that will disinfect and clean. But they are good until you can see a mechanical tear or a problem. Uh, the KN95s that are being uh, sold uh, to the general public are so variable that I, I would hesitate to make a comment and suggest that there probably is no knowledge. And Dr. Joseph, a follow-up to reassure people that if you're 10 feet or so apart outdoors, how safe that is without a mask? Well, as science supports that there's, there's minimal risk beyond six feet without a mask. The, the air exchange of the outdoor air is so uh, rapid that it, it requires a, an imagination to, to how one person could affect another one greater than six feet away outside. But with a caveat, even though the science supports that, and that's what's being published in the research, it is very important to follow the order of the county health officer. And some counties may be more strict than others. Some may require more than six feet. I would never want to get, go against what a county health officer says is required because it takes in so much more than science. You know, the, the county health orders are not based on, on reviewing medical literature. They're based on understanding medical literature and the community and how the two have to be merged. So please follow the county health orders, and, and I'm happy to discuss the, the science that goes into that order. 